Hello, and behind me is an Airbus A300, which is a really significant aircraft for two reasons. Firstly, this was the first twin widebody airliner, which has now become the norm. The other reason is that this is the first Airbus. So back when this aircraft was being designed, no one had even heard of the company, but now they are the absolute force of aviation that they are. And in this video, I'm gonna take you on a detailed tour of it. I'm Paul Stewart, and I make videos about planes. This includes reviews of flights around the world and guided tours through interesting aircraft in museums. Please check out my channel and subscribe. And a massive thanks to the Aeroscopia Museum in Toulouse, France for letting me film this aircraft. I've got more videos from this visit coming very soon. Europe was aware that the Americans were dominating the civil aviation market and they wanted to join in. In 1967, planning begins with the Germans designing the fuselage, the British and the Netherlands doing the wings, French the cockpit and control systems and Spain designing the tailplane. Then in 1972, we got this, the Airbus A300. Starting at the nose, I should point out that this specific aircraft is an A300B4 that has been repainted in the first A300B1 prototype colors and registration. The original prototype itself was unfortunately broken up years ago. Many other larger airliners of the time had either four engines like the 707 and 747 or three engines. A major advantage of the A300 was that it only had two engines which reduced the cost of manufacturing and maintenance as well as reduced the fuel consumption. Positioning them under the wing in pods in comparison to installing them within the wing as we saw with the de Havilland Comet or in the tail like the VC-10 or 727 means that they can be easily accessed for maintenance and even replaced. It also makes the job of adding larger engines easier with later upgrades to the aircraft. These days the big twins dominate the market but at the time only small aircraft had two jet engines. Initial variants were powered by either General Electric CF6 or Pratt & Whitney JT9D turbofans, although upgraded engines from both manufacturers were later installed. The JT9D was the somewhat controversial engine used in the first 747, although this example here has the General Electric engine. Airbus were keen on entering the North American market, so the use of American engines was an important part of the marketing plan. Of interest, the British government withdrew from the Airbus venture shortly after Rolls-Royce engines were dropped, but Hawker Siddeley still made the wings. I zoom in here to highlight the bypass section of the turbofan. As I've explained in other videos, the turbofan design was a major leap forward with jet engines and essentially involves having a jet power a large fan in front of the engine which acts as a propeller and pushes the air, bypassing the hot core and also creating thrust. The CFM56 engine on display at the museum really shows how much air actually bypasses the hot core. For interest sake, here's also part of the engine cowling of the A380's much larger engine. Now back to the A300, and let's talk about the wing. These lines here are the leading edge slats which could be deployed at lower speeds during takeoff and landing to increase lift. Then they'd be retracted at higher speeds to improve efficiency during cruising. These here are simply aerodynamic flap canoes covering the flap mechanisms which would otherwise be gangly metal bits affecting the airflow. This here is a wing fence designed to keep the air moving over the wings in a straight line rather than it being tempted to move sideways which could potentially stall the entire wing. And then moving out to the end you find no winglet which was the norm for this era as the aerodynamic benefits weren't yet known. A wing fence was added to the A300-600 which reduced fuel consumption during cruise by 1.5% and the A330 had a much larger winglet added as well. Another particular advance with this aircraft was the first use of a supercritical airfoil sections of the wing in any airliner. Now it's hard to explain but older wing shapes were essentially stretched water drops but this introduced more of a concave shape in the trailing half of the wing. So it bulges out a little at the first half and it's concave in the latter half. This increased fuel efficiency and a similar shape was used in the Boeing's 757, 767 and 777. There were two main landing gears with four tyres each and it had electronic braking by wire. The A340, which was a modified and extended version of this aircraft, had another landing gear due to its additional weight. Here's the A380's main landing gear at the same museum, just again for comparison's sake, and it's an incredibly complex mechanism. This contraption here is a part of the main cabin pressurization system. Hot and pressurized air is bled off the engines and is cooled down via cold air that will enter via this system. And if there was a dual engine and APU failure, 
cabin pressure could be maintained by simply directing the high speed external air into the pressurization system itself. Now let's jump over to the starboard side of the aircraft. As well as being a popular passenger airliner, the A300 was actually one of the best selling freighter aircraft of all time. The passenger floor was raised providing a larger cargo hold allowing for LD3 freight containers to fit in side by side. Here's the massive cargo door required to allow easy access for these containers. And for comparison's sake, here's footage of the A340-600 also on display at the same museum where the lengthened fuselage forward of the wing is really quite pronounced. In 1977, it became the first ETOPS compliant twin engine airliner allowing for it to operate beyond 60 minutes from land. There's a lot of aircraft squashed together, so I'll briefly break in the filming and I've appeared again on the other side of engine number two. The A300 was the first airline to use composite materials with the leading and trailing edge of the tail fin being made of glass fibre reinforced plastic. This was a useful weight saving tool, which was especially important with only two engines. Later on, more composites were used for landing gear doors, spoilers, air brakes, uh, the ray dome and the rudder. The lack of having heavy engines in the tail meant that the wing could be further forward, thus decreasing the size of the vertical stabilizer and elevator, which in turn did improve performance. Now the rear mounted engines do have other benefits, and check out my tour through the 727 or the VC10 for more information about those. Right here is the auxiliary power unit which could operate many of the onboard systems while the main engines were turned off. Another advantage of not having a tail mounted engine is that this creates more space for the APU and this position is essentially where all modern airliners put them. For comparison's sake, the Boeing 727 which had three rear mounted engines put the APU inside the landing gear bay and vented the exhaust up above the starboard wing. Now let's go inside this fascinating aircraft. A lot of the plastics have been stripped away, allowing you to see much of the underlying structures. It's interesting here seeing the space between the insulated wall and the flight engineer's panel. Let's talk about this cockpit in more detail. The first thing I'll mention are these handles which are inertial reels. They're designed to allow the crew to hold on to these as they escape through the cockpit windows and a cable lowers them slowly to the ground. Obviously at this height, jumping through these windows without anything else would result in many fractures if you're lucky. As you'd expect with an aircraft of this era, the screens are all analog. Again, it wasn't until the A330 upgrade that the glass cockpit with screens was introduced and shared with the smaller A320. Next up, you'll notice these yokes which are similar in design to what Boeing uses. Although as you know now, Airbus uses the side sticks. Both have positives and negatives, although I'm sure that Airbus keyboard warriors would be horrified to see that they started with yokes as well. It wasn't until the later A330 major upgrade in 1992 where the side stick was introduced, and that was from the smaller A320. Initially this was a three person cockpit with two pilots at the front and a flight engineer on the right hand side. This was a relic of an era where a lot of the aircraft systems, such as the fuel movement, had to be done manually, although this job was completely computerized with the A300-600, which first flew in 1983. In fact, this was the first wide body airliner operating with just two crew, and the airlines loved it, of course, because they didn't have to pay for an extra crew member. Let's continue to explore the rest of the interior. Different layers have been peeled back, so you can see structures underneath, which is really interesting. These large pipes here are a part of that cabin pressurization system I mentioned earlier, and looking down through the floor, you can see the cargo containers in the extra large forward cargo hold. While it did have electric secondary flight controls, the primary controls were still operated by these physical cables. These run directly from the cockpit out to the wings and the tail of the aircraft, and they're duplicated on the other side as well. The A320 was the first airliner with an all-digital fly-by-wire control system and that was installed into the A330 version of this aircraft in the 1990s. And looking up above you, you have more piping from the air conditioning system. Let's make our way further back and check out the cabin that is now starting to look a lot more like an A300 that you may have been familiar with. The seats and economy are in a 242 layout with two aisles. Remember that before this, most airliners, even long held ones like the 707 and VC-10, all had single aisles, so inside this would have seemed like an extremely spacious airliner. Moving further back are examples of the business class seats. Now they would usually be further forward, but as you may recall, the floor was removed and covered with glass, so they've just moved their seats back here. 
and further back are more design concepts for private VIP aircraft. The A300 introduced many new features. It had a state-of-the-art center of gravity control system that would transfer fuel between different tanks in the aircraft. It was also the first airliner to have an airborne wind shear detection system. The weather radar scans for evidence of vertical wind shear conditions ahead and then provides a visual and audio warning to the crew. The A300 debuted in September 1972 and in 1973 it did a long sales trip to South and then North America. It completed 40 demonstration flights with both airline and travel executives on board. They know that it would have been difficult to break into the very patriotic American market, but that was where a lot of the profits would be made. Jim Austin, the Boeing VP in 1977, was quoted as saying it's a typical government airplane. They'll build a dozen or so and then go out of business. Um, well, oops, <laughs> and it's not like Boeing gets a lot of help from the US taxpayer either. In a very clever deal, Airbus gave four A300s to Eastern Airlines for six months at completely no cost. The airline fell in love with them and subsequently ordered 23 more and the rest is history. Another interesting fact is that they intentionally decided to design the aircraft in English and use metric measurements because again, the United States was going to be their target market. They also wanted to avoid the problems that we saw with Concorde where both French and British engineers misunderstood each other leading to some miscalculations. There were multiple variants made but I'll just mention the main ones. The production aircraft was lengthened from the prototype to allow for extra seats and cargo. Additional fuel tanks were also added to increase the range because initially it couldn't fly very far for a wide body, but that did reduce cargo capacity. The first major upgrade was the A300-600, which I've mentioned earlier, and was lengthened and the wing was modified. The cockpit was also modernized and the flight engineer was removed, and a total of 313 of these were built. But with all the fuselage lengthening, Airbus realized that they needed a shorter version and in 1983, the A310 received certification. It was the same width as the A300, but was 6.95 meters shorter than the original A300 design before that itself was stretched. 255 of these were built and it just arrived before the Boeing 767-200. In 1992, the next major upgrade happened where the A330 took to the skies. This was based on the A300, although heavily modified, and then in 1993 we saw the four-engined A340, which you also see here on display in Toulouse. And there's now the A330neo, or new engine option, so the story continues. From this steady base, Airbus were able to go on to build the incredibly popular A320, and of course the largest airliner ever, the A380, which hasn't been a huge economic success, but it'll go down as one of the most impressive airliners ever built. Between 1971 and 2007, a total of 560 A300s were built and many remain flying to this day. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and check out my channel for many more similar videos. Thanks for watching.